One difficulty which should be avoided comes from mixing up the speculative with the ratiocinative methods so that what is said of the subject at one time signifies its notion, at another time merely its predicate or accidental property. The one method interferes with the other, and only a philosophical exhibition that rigidly excludes the usual way of relating the parts of a proposition could achieve the goal of plasticity. This is a very short paragraph, and I don't think that there's an awful lot that has to be said about it at this point. Some of what Hegel is doing here is just sort of summarizing and review for us, but, you know, it's worth hitting on very quickly just to reinforce these notions in our mind. Before that, there's, there's a term that he's using that I want to clarify, in part because it's come to mean, or it's come to have a lot of different associations for us that it, it would have had in his time, and that word is plastic, um, and, and it's a direct, you know, cognate to the German plastiche here. And when, when we, you know, late moderns are thinking of, of plastic, what comes to mind, this is a great example actually for Hegel, because in Hegel's time, it would have meant something that's an adjective, which describes a certain kind of state. For us, it's actually become uh, a substance. It's become substantified. This is one of those examples of something becoming actual and then attaining a kind of universality for us and a concreteness that it didn't have for Hegel. They would talk, for example, about the plastic arts, sculpture as being a prime example. What is the sculptor doing? Uh, you know, you can think of the marble sculptor who's, you know, chipping away at things, <clears throat> but think in part of the one who's working in clay. So you're molding things, you're, you're bending them. That's what it is to be plastic. So when people started experimenting with the kinds of substances that we call plastic, which is, you know, a ubiquitous part of our life, there's, <coughs> there's plastic in my buttons on my shirt, um, there's some bits of plastic, I'm sure, in this somewhere along the line, maybe the varnish is, is, is in some way some plastic, um, you know, we're surrounded by plastic as substances, and, and in all different kinds of forms. We're used to it being soft, we're used to it being super hard, everything in between. Why is it called plastic? Well, because it's moldable. That's what, what makes it so versatile for us. That's why it's become such a, a major part of our environment. Actually, something that's destroying our environment as well, our physical, natural environment. Um, you can do molding with plastic. You can make it into the kind of shape that you want. So how is Hegel bringing that up? He's talking about um, our minds having that kind of plasticity and a philosophical exposition that rigidly excludes the usual way of relating the parts of a proposition that would attain a goal of plasticity. Um, we're not gonna have that in many cases. This is an ideal and the ideal would be to be completely moldable, completely shapeable. So that's what he's meaning there. That's, that's a good thing to keep in mind. <clears throat> um, now, he's talking about how the subject is understood in two different modes of thinking. Uh, these are visa, ways, um, translated here as, as modes, but you can think of it as, as methods. So we have the ratiocinative argumentative approach, you know, raison near end out. we've seen this used a lot. This is the typical sort of enlightenment way. It's also the sort of gotcha reasoning kind of way. It's, it's often quite negative. Remember, it can lapse into vanity or futility. It's something that's um, always available to us. We can always criticize. We can always point out problems. We can always, you know, draw conclusions. We can always reason things out. But that doesn't mean that we're always getting at the reality or the truth of things. Sometimes it leads us astray. Then we have the speculative or dialectical way of approaching these things. And they're both working with subjects. They're both working with grammatical subjects. And so how does the ratiocinative approach? It connects it to predicates. It connects it to accidental properties, predicated of it. You know, I am here in this place at this time. I am also on your video screen at whatever time you're watching this, or whatever, I mean, it could be years from now that you're watching this. Um, those are accidental properties. 
They're not, they're not really essential. Another thing that you could put over here is that speculative deals with the essences. That, that which really matters, that which is really at the heart of things, that which changes things, that's, that which is most relevant. The notion, the begriff, the concept um, that the dialectic works with, that is to be found you know, in, in the speculative way of looking at the subject. So the goal is to turn this stuff over here when we run into it, into this, or to like bring it in there. But sometimes it has to just consist in saying, nah, sorry, you missed it. You didn't get it. You're, you're reasoning stuff out, but you're just not getting it. Again, you know, I've mentioned a couple times in recent videos that um, some of this can apply to the way I handle my comments. When somebody just goes like totally off the rails, Oftentimes, I don't even bother to engage with them. You know why? Because life is short and because I want to think things out further. And, you know, if they're caught up in this, um, maybe it's time for them to approach it, you know, with somebody else down the line, you know, when they can see the futility of this and they want something more. Um, that's really all there is to be said about this section, I think. As a matter of fact, non-speculative thinking also has its valid rights, which are disregarded in the speculative way of stating a proposition. The sublation of the form of the proposition must not happen only in an immediate manner through the mere con content of the proposition. On the contrary, this opposite movement must find explicit expression. It must not just be the inward inhibition mentioned above. This return of the notion into itself must be set forth. This movement, which constitutes what formerly the proof was supposed to accomplish, is the dialectical movement of the proposition itself. This alone is the speculative in act, and only the expression of this movement is a speculative exhibition, exposition. As a proposition, the speculative is only the internal inhibition and the non-essential return of the essence into itself. Hence, we often find philosophical expositions referring us to this inner intuition, and in this way they evade the systematic exposition of the dialectical movement of the proposition which we have demanded. The proposition should express what the true is, but essentially the true is subject. As such, it is merely the dialectical movement, this course that generates itself, going forth from and returning into itself. In non-speculative cognition, proof constitutes this side of expressed inwardness. But once the dialectic has been separated from proof, the notion of philosophical demonstration has been lost. Looking at section 65, it's interesting that, that Hegel starts out by talking about non-speculative thinking. And there, you know, keep in mind what we're covering, not just, um, you know, raisonier in the, the argumentative or ratiocinative approach, but also appeals to intuition, common sense, uh, picture thinking. All of these have their, their rights. All of them have a certain legitimacy to them, all of them have a proper function. It's just when they get substituted for philosophy that we have a problem. And so he's going to say here, he doesn't actually use the word responsibility, but I'm using this in part because we've got this, this conception that rights of another often entail responsibilities on one's own part. So speculative thinking bears certain responsibilities for itself, for those who are engaging in it, but also in relation to non-speculative forms of thinking. And he gives you a number of different points that I've summarized here. He says, the sublation of the form of the proposition must not happen only in an immediate manner through the mere content of the proposition. So that's one that's important to dwell on. Sublation is this term, aufhebung, sublation is, is just you know an English way of, of trying to sort of get the cognate across. What is aufhebung? We've talked about this. This is a really central Hegelian concept. Um, Aufhebung means a sort of transcendence that incorporates what is being transcended, or at least incorporates its most important moments or parts and brings about a greater, a higher type of unity, a whole. 
something that is, is you might say, not able to be completely viewed from the, the previous position, what, the, you know, the previous uh, shape of consciousness. What's been transcended in this case is the proposition. So how has that been transcended? How has that been sublated? It's been shown to contain the, the possibilities for a kind of distinction, then a kind of unification, the subject disappearing into the predicate, also being found in the predicate, this non-vicious circularity that we've, we've talked about already. So all that has to be done, he says, not in an immediate manner, I put happen immediately, um, but in an immediate manner, that is, in an unmediated way, without sort of thinking it through, without making it explicit what's going on. So he says, on the contrary, this opposite movement must find explicit expression. It must not be the inward inhibition mentioned above. This return into the, of the notion into itself must be set forth. So if we're dealing with a subject that in its relation to a predicate becomes a notion, a concept, a begriff, a self-moving entity whose development we can sit back and observe, or perhaps which is taking place within us, perhaps we're involved in, in that notion and its development. If that's the case, then what's going to happen is the notion is going to self-alter, it's going to self-other, and it's going to reincorporate what has been othered in that process. That's the process of negativity, of, of determinate negation. So the return of the notion into itself must be set forth, he's saying. We have to actually make it explicit. We can't just sort of say, well, I'm just going to sit back and watch. We have to document it, you might, you might say. Um, this movement, he says, which constitutes uh, what formerly the proof was supposed to accomplish, that's worth dwelling on. Proof... You notice we're, we're going back now to thinking in terms of this, you know, either reasoning way of approaching things or the, the one that was modeled on mathematics, mathematical cognition, mathematical style. Proof was supposed to yield us something um, that we could be completely confident about, but it's also important because of all the, the back stuff. You, you remember back in geometry class, if you guys still do proofs in geometry class, um, did you ever get docked for not showing your work? And you say, well, it doesn't matter. All we're interested in is the result. Well, no, the proof is the, the stuff that leads to the result. So what does speculative thinking have in place of that? It has the documentation, the, the analysis, the watching, the making explicit of what's actually going on in the, the you know, transition from one shape of consciousness to another one in the, the dialectic. So he says, this is the dialectical movement of the proposition itself. This alone is the speculative in act, and only the expression of this movement is a speculative exposition. Now, here he's talking about at the level of the proposition, but we can also talk about larger levels as well that this is going to go for. But notice that means that we can also sort of bear down to the proposition itself. The sort of developments that are taking place historically are not something that are totally beyond our grasp. We can express them in propositions. We can express them propositionally in terms of subject and predicate. But we have to be prepared for some sort of dynamic interplay between those. So he says, as a proposition, the speculative is only the internal inhibition and non-existential return of the essence into itself. What, is, what does that mean? Here he's talking about, remember back a few paragraphs before, how consciousness gets sort of stymied when the, the predicate assumes the importance and the subject kind of disappears into the predicate, and then we have to rediscover the, the subject within the predicate. We, uh, we rediscover the predicate as having a substantiality to itself. So he says, um, what is the, the result of this? Well... We often find philosophical expositions making appeal to inner intuition. And why would they make that appeal? Remember, Hegel's generally going to be seeing intuition as a bad thing. But in this case, maybe he would have good grounds for saying, well, you just have to like, you know, you have to have the right intuition of it. You've got to have developed far enough. Um, 
There's a certain truth to that here. But it doesn't go far enough. Why? Well, because there's an arbitrariness to intuition that we've already seen, but also because when you appeal to the inner, you're not being fully dialectical. You're not fully taking speculative thinking where it needs to go. He says, they evade the systematic exposition of the dialectical movement of the proposition, which we've demanded. So, you can't just appeal to intuition. You have to be systematic, and you have to be systematic in setting out. That's what an exposition is. You're laying everything out and saying how everything's connected to everything else. So, he says, the proposition should express what the true is, but essentially the true is subject. This is not something new at this point. As such, it's merely the dialectical movement, the course that generates itself, going forth from and returning to itself. In the non-speculative proposition, proof is what we're looking for. Does that mean that we're not looking for proof at all, device, demonstration, in, in this? No. Proof does have some value. He says once the dialectic has been separated from proof, the notion of philosophical demonstration has been lost. What does that mean? That means that we do have to be engaged in a process where we, if we're the ones who are in the privileged position, able to look at this panorama of history in a synoptic fashion and see the development taking place, we can't just say that to each other as sort of an Illuminati or intelligentsia. We have to be able to explain this to other rational subjects so that they can also participate in that community of inquiry and they can see what's going on. If we're not doing that, something is falling short. Something is not fully being developed and we should actually begin to be a little bit suspect about our own position, that perhaps it contains some idiosyncrasies, some eccentricities, that it's not as fully developed as it ought to be. In some ways, the test of whether, you know, if we go back to Plato, the test of whether you truly know something is whether you're able to teach it to somebody else. It's kind of funny because, you know, there's that old adage, those who, you know, know something do it, those who don't know it teach. Hegel would say that's completely wrong. In order to actually teach effectively, you actually need to know what it is that you're teaching about. And part of what teaching really is, is taking what is inner and making it outer, making it exterior, laying it out for others, taking the esoteric and making it exoteric you can say. So, this is a very important passage because he's, again, he's stressing the rights of non-speculative thinking by stressing what it is that speculative thinking ought to do, how it ought to conduct itself. Here we should bear in mind that the dialectical movement likewise has propositions for its parts or elements. The difficulty just indicated seems, therefore, to recur perpetually and to be inherent in the very nature of philosophical exposition. This is like what happens in ordinary proof, where the reasons given are themselves in, in need of further reasons, and so on ad infinitum. This pattern of giving reasons and stating conditions belongs to that method of proof which differs from the dialectical movement and belongs, therefore, to external cognition. As regards the dialectical movement itself, its element is the one notion, it thus has a content which is, in its own self, subject through and through. Thus, no content occurs which functions as an underlying subject, nor receives its meaning as a predicate. The proposition, as it is, stands merely as an empty form. Apart from the self that is sensuously intuited or represented, it is above all the name as name that designates the pure sub subject, the empty unit without thought content. For this reason, it may be expedient for example, to avoid the name God, since this word is not immediately also a notion, but rather the proper name, the fixed point of rest of the underlying subject. Whereas, on the other hand, for example, being, or the one, singularity, the subject, etc., themselves at, what, at once suggest concepts. Even if speculative truths are affirmed of this subject, their content lacks the imminent notion because it is present merely in the form of a passive subject, with the result that such truths readily assume the form of mere edification. 
From this side, too, the habit of expressing the speculative predicate in the form of a proposition and not as notion and essence creates a difficulty that can be increased or diminished through the very way in which philosophy is expounded. In keeping with our insight into the nature of speculation, the ex exposition should preserve the dialectical form and should admit nothing except insofar as it is comprehended in terms of the notion and is the notion. Here in section 66, Hegel is bringing together several threads that he has previously developed in some of the, the earlier paragraphs, and he's going to bring us to one of these important crux points. You could, you could summarize it by saying that philosophy, speculative philosophy, dialectical philosophy included, cannot dispense with the fact that it's rooted within language, and everything that language then ends up bringing. And so, you know, if, if it's going to work, it's going to have to work by transforming the linguistic elements, the linguistic parts, the linguistic resources that it has before it, rather than just taking them for granted as the conditions that it has to, to work under. In this respect, you could say, in a way, that <coughs> Hegel's phenomenology is the, the opposite of something like ordinary language philosophy, which developed out of a reaction against idealism in Britain, which had been influenced by Hegel, um, which took, you know, the limits of language as being the limits of my world, if we want to use Wittgenstein's Tractatus formulation. Um, Hegel is, is holding out hope for us being able to, to think through how we're using language. So he says, the dialectical movement has propositions for its parts and its elements. So the difficulty that we've just indicated seems to recur perpetually and to be inherent in the very nature of philosophical exposition. Here he's going to say something about ordinary proof or proof that's not dialectical and some of the problems with it that were pointed out by uh, skeptics in the ancient world and, and which we can still say are problems today. Um, but I also, before we go into that, I want to point out something else. You might object to Hegel, and you might object to the worries about this, you know, propositions having subject predicate form. You could say, well, not all language is built like German, or built like the Indo-European family of languages that use that. You know, there's these other, you know, languages, and they have their own way of, of parsing up grammar and the world, and it's very different than our own, and it's, you know, a, just as original, a relation to the world. And so maybe we could model it on, on those. You know, maybe we don't have to have substances and subjects and predicates. <clears throat> and, you know, there's a certain truth to that. But I want you to realize something whenever you say that sort of thing. Likewise, whenever you talk about what, what lies beyond language, mystical insights that can't be communicated... You're still using language, and you're still using the kind of language that we in the West have come, you know, we've become accustomed to using, and it's pretty hard to get away from it. Because if you want to say, you know, there's other languages that are not subject predicate form dependent, and we should be using those, notice what you're doing. There's other languages, there's your subject, and they're not subject predicate dependent. You've just done a subject predicate thing, right? So you're, you're replicating the same problem, you're just pushing it a little bit deeper. And we could go on and on about that, that sort of thing, but, you know, maybe, maybe later on. So he talks about ordinary proof, and he says the reasons given themselves are in need of further reasons, and so on ad infinitum. You can say this about, you know, logical deductions. Well, why do we have to accept the rules of inference that are used in logical deductions? You know, why do we have to accept the, the law of the excluded middle? Can you provide me a proof for that? You know, at a certain point, you have to actually call a stop to that sort of thing, or else you're going to be stuck in skepticism forever. So he says, um, this pattern of giving reasons and stating conditions belongs to that method of proof which differs from the dialectical movement. It belongs to external cognition, like a cognition that knows the thing but stays outside of it, that doesn't penetrate into the phenomenon itself. As regards the dialectical movement, its element is the one notion, he said. It has a content which is in its own self 
subject through and through. Now, how does that connect up with what he's saying here? He does, he's not making that fully explicit. He says, no content occurs which functions as an underlying subject, nor receives its meaning as a predicate. The proposition as it stands is merely an empty form. That doesn't actually sound very good. But if we think about what happens in the phenomenology, what's been going on up to this point, what's, what's being promised to happen, um, in these propositions, which are part of the dialectical movement, where we're moving from one proposition to the next, and we also have this interior dialectic taking place, where the subject is getting lost in the predicate, and then getting refound in the predicate, there's this return to itself. You can say that there's this, this level of sort of complexity where this is getting assumed into this and then coming back to it, this is getting assumed into this and coming back to it. Okay, so that is part of what Hegel means by, by notion, this dynamic, self-developing, um, complex process that's going to yield us a subject that runs through all of us. So this subject here can't be strictly identified with the subject here, the subject here, the subject here. It's something that's a bit deeper. And guess, guess what that subject is? Well, it's the, it's the notion itself. Go a little bit further. It's us. It's also us, the, the knowing, the thinking, the acting, the appropriating subject as well. So now he's going to take a shift in the, in the second paragraph of this, this section. He says, apart from the self that is sensu sensuously intuited or represented, right? So I, what, is, what is the self that's sensuously intuited or represented? I can look in the mirror and I can see I'm wearing this tie. I can, you know, see that I have lines in my face because I'm 44 years old. Um, it's above all the name that designates the pure subject, the empty unit without thought content. He's going to talk about God, but let's, let's stop for a second. Let's use something like this. A piece of chalk. It's worn down halfway through. Chalk. That term chalk, let's write it up here. Interestingly, this is the, the, lex, the, the uh, not lexical, but this is the uh, visual equivalent of an automatopoeia, right? where the, the, the name sounds like the thing, like if I say squawk, right? Um, I, wrote, I wrote chalk out of chalk on, on the chalkboard, right? So there's a little funny reflexivity there to it. But that word chalk, although it's made of chalk, is not the same thing as the piece of chalk. And if you want to know what the piece of chalk is, you probably should do less of paying attention to you know, the letters and more looking at this actual thing, or look at how the letters were, were made of this substance that we call chalk. We can say the same thing of uh, many other things. Freedom, for example, when we start predicating things of freedom. So he says, for this reason, it may be expedient to avoid the name God. Why? Why should we avoid the name God? Because we have no idea what the hell it means, at least at the beginning. By the end of the phenomenology, we actually, you know, the, the penultimate chapter of the phenomenology is called religion. And we're going to learn an awful lot about what God is, and it's going to turn out that we have a very intimate connection with God. I don't want to give away the, you know, the, the secret of the ending if you haven't already read about it in an encyclopedia or something like that. But I'll say this. Um, Stanley Rosen says that if Hegel was an Orthodox Christian, he certainly belonged to a church with only one member, that is himself. And uh, I think that's pretty accurate to say about him. So Hegel says, at the beginning we should avoid the word God. Why? Because the word is not immediately a notion, but rather the proper name, the fixed point of rest of the underlying subject. People have said all sorts of things about God throughout history, and the name is kind of like a worn-out coin at this point. We're not quite sure what it means or what it can be exchanged for as a subject. What are other things that we can talk about instead of God? It says, being, the one, singularity, the subject. What advantage do those have over God? It says they, at the very beginning, suggest concepts. They, they suggest notions. They suggest things that we can start wrapping our head around, whereas God has become sort of an empty name, which can obtain some content later on, but we can't use that as a, as a beginning point. Here you see like a radical split between 
philosophy and some sort of, you know, theology, although what Hegel's doing could be understood as a type of theology as well. I, I don't want anyone to get upset and object that. So he says, even if speculative truths are affirmed to this subject, their content lacks the imminent notion because it's present merely in the form of a passive subject with the result that such truths readily assume the form of mere edification. A lot of our God talk, according to Hegel, doesn't really amount to much. It may make us feel warm and fuzzy. God is love. Um, that's not actually teaching us something. But if we say being, or the singularity is love, now we're actually starting to dig our heels in and sink our teeth into some sort of meat, you could say. Uh, so he says... From this side, too, the habit of expressing the speculative predicate in the form of a proposition, and not as notion and essence, creates a difficulty. And this difficulty is not an absolutely insurmountable one, but it's one that can be increased or diminished through the very way in which philosophy is expounded. If, for example, we were to try to reduce Hegel to a textbook, we would be increasing the difficulty, because the textbook is going to use the tired old subject predicate. Predicates really just mean accidental qualities. We already know everything to begin with. I'm just communicating the knowledge. There's no experimentation. There's no excitement. There's no witnessing, you know, truth itself developing over time happening with the textbook. What about a commentary? What about what we're doing right here? Good question. I leave that one up to you to think about. Are we doing something that's just sort of trotting out old formulas? Hegel means this, Hegel means that, you know, this is equivalent to that, and that's equivalent to this, so therefore we can have it all set up and it all makes sense. Is that what we're doing right now, or are we trying to follow along with the dialectical development that he's, he's tracing out for us, and seeing it not as something that just was traced out once and for all in 1807, but something that we could ourselves participate in and get to know anew. I hope it's the, the latter. So he says, um, it creates a difficulty that can be increased or diminished through the very way in which philosophy is expounded. In keeping with our insight into the nature of speculation, the exposition should preserve the dialectical form. Why? It should admit nothing except insofar as it's comprehended in terms of the notion and is the notion. Why? Well, because if the form doesn't to some degree resemble the content, then we've got a weird sort of dichotomy here where we're trying to do all this, you know, radical stuff over here with the content, but we're going to do it in the same old tired way. Now, what are the implications for this? The implications for this is that Hegel is doing philosophy in a new way, not just by approaching new topics or, you know, dealing with the topics in a different way, but by presenting it in a different way, by laying it out for us in a way that demands some changes on our own part, having to do with our, the way in which we're accustomed to thinking about things. 